this discussion is uh, for universal attendance, wherever you are across America. We thank you for being a part of this. Uh, we love it when we can take down the walls of our, our classroom and, and, and have you all attend some of these conversations. And this will be an extraordinary conversation with, with a gentleman who's written a book, uh, The Kent State Shooting 50 Years Later, When Truth Mattered. And I have, um, have the greatest respect for this man. He has, uh, what uh, Professor Rotman didn't say is he's had decades in the newspaper business, as have I and, uh, and our guest today. Uh, I think it's about 100 years among the three of us. Uh, and I won't tell you how that breaks out. But this is a man who early in his career led the Akron Beacon Journal to a Pulitzer Prize covering one of the greatest tragedies in American history at Kent State. He also was an editor at the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle and then went on to lead the Detroit News where another Pulitzer Prize was won by that paper. Uh, in between, he has, he has had an extraordinary career um, I mean, every few years he would dip back in academics. He literally wrote the book uh, on, on how to manage a newsroom. And I found that throughout my career to be uh, in incredibly helpful. He also is a Neiman Fellow uh, and uh, subsequently was a curator uh, with Neiman and has done that. Uh, he was curator until uh, 2011. We are honored to have him. Welcome, Robert Giles. Thanks very much, Ken and Andrew and students. Nice to be with you. So one of the things that I've learned over time as a professor and dean is that my clearest memories were not even experiences for my students. Uh, and even though people of my generation, Kent State means something immediately. We, we have visual images. Could you set the stage for us as to what happened uh, on the campus of Kent State University in 1970. What was the world doing then? Well, the world was uh, involved in the anti-war protest. That was the main focus in, in, on a lot of college campuses in the 1960s and 70s. Kent State was a kind of a modest uh, rural kind of university that had had a, an explosion of growth in the 1960s and it had become not a hotbed of protest, but they had had some, some of their own. It was the last place in the world, uh, from my view, that you would expect to see violence. Uh, the, the triggering episode that started a, a series of protests around the country on college campuses was on April 30th, a Thursday night, when President Nixon went before the country and announced that he was sending troops into Cambodia. And there were widespread protests on college campuses. They were generally peaceful. But at Kent State on the following day, on Friday, about 500 students gathered on the, camp, the Commons, which was a, a gathering place for students. Uh, and, and they had a victory bell there that they rang when they won a football game. And they, they dug a hole right by the, the victory bell. They tore a page out of the US Constitution and buried it, claiming it was the Nixon speech was the death of, of the Constitution because he had violated the Constitution by not going to Congress to get approval to send American fighting troops into another country. Uh, on Friday evening, uh, the students were uh, celebrating the end of the academic year and the beginning of, of their term exams. And as was the custom, they had gathered in the bars on uh, downtown Kent. And the mayor got nervous about it uh, because uh, of the uh, demonstration on the campus that afternoon. And he ordered the police of the city of Kent to kick the kids out of the bars. And so here you had a situation where uh, these, uh, some inebriated, some celebratory students were milling around downtown and some of them took their beer bottles with them outside the, the bars and started throwing them to the windows and so on. Uh, the mayor then uh, kind of panicked and he called Columbus, the state capital, and asked for the governor to send in 
the Ohio National Guard to provide a s safety for uh, the, the town and, and the campus. Um, the following day, there were some arrests made that evening. And the following that evening, the students called for a rally at the ROTC building. It was an old uh, World War II type uh, structure uh, made out of wood. Uh, they lit it on fire. Uh, the police, uh, the fire department came and uh, the students cut the fire hoses so that the fire wouldn't go out and the students, uh, then the students uh, cheered and the building burned down. Uh, on, uh, on, uh, that was Saturday night. On Sunday, um, the National Guard had arrived and they had taken up a, a bivouac place on the, on the edge of the commons so that they were well within the view of the students. And this began to build a resentment on, among the students about the appearance of armed guardsmen on their campus. The students uh, kind of had a, a, a celebratory day with the, with the uh, guardsmen. They were curious about one another. Some of them played Frisbee. Uh, there was a, uh, one famous moment when uh, one of the students, who was later to be a victim, Allison Krauss, took a flower and put it in uh, the barrel of one of the guns and said, flowers are better than bullets. During the morning, Ohio's governor, Jim Rhodes, appeared on campus and seeing a leadership vacuum, the, the president of the, of the university, Robert White, was not there. He had gone off to a meeting in Iowa uh, and so they, he took charge. Uh, and among uh, one of his first meetings was uh, with local officials and the county prosecutor, Ron Kane, said, Governor, I'm urging you to order the campus closed now because there's too much volatility. Something is going to, dangerous is going to happen. And, and Governor Rhodes, who was very much against student rallies and student protesters and thought of the, <clears throat> the students, demonstrators as radicals, said, oh no, I can't do that because if, if I close the campus now, my, my, my opponents will say, I'm weak. Uh, so uh, and instead, he, he turned to the National Guard commander and said, uh, there's a rally planned for Monday at noon. And my order is that there will be no assembly of uh, peaceful or, or otherwise. Uh, what is critical about Rhodes' behavior uh, at this moment is that he was engaged in a very close race to win the Ohio uh, Rep Republican uh, senatorial nomination against a famous Ohio political name, Bob Taft. And uh, he was, it was a close race, which he eventually would lose, but he wanted to show his base, what a tough guy he was uh, in putting down the protests and the statements and the activities of these student, students, what he called the student radicals. Bob, if I could just interject for a second, you have beautifully set up the weekend. Of course, Monday is gonna be the fateful day, but I want the students who are watching this to just think about this. Kent State, in its way, in its era, was no more radical or politicized than Middle Tennessee State University is today. Um, this was not an elite liberal school. This was not a particularly political school. This was not Berkeley. This was not Columbia. This was in the middle of America, not a lot different from our campus as well. And so just imagine, if you will, if you're out there on, on the weekend, you You've gone out the night before, you've gone to bars that are popular with college students and people have broken windows. And then on our campus, somebody sets fire to a building. And on our campus, here come tanks and armed troops. And, you know, that should sound like an out-of-body experience to you because it felt that way, I'm sure, for Kent State students. It's, this is unbelievable that's happening on our campus. The other thing I wanted to mention, because I was of that generation, um, is that the, the big difference between the students walking across our campus today and then was that those students, those male students were subject to the draft. 
and many had no idea of knowing what, how they'd spend the next two or three years of their life. We would get a number that would tell us roughly in what order we'd be drafted. But as much as people felt the war in Vietnam was immoral uh, and the wrong war and unwinnable, if we're truthful, a huge percentage of those folks also feared that they would lose their life in foreign land for no good reason. And that's what created the real fervor on campuses. Uh, now we have an all-volunteer all army. It's a different dynamic entirely. But um, that's why passions were particularly high in America at that point. We had an entire generation that was angry and fearful. And that's, that's what was really the case at, at Kent State because uh, the, the themes of their rallies in part included being opposed to the draft. Uh, that, was a, that was a critical fear in the, in the hearts and minds of many of the young male students. Uh, so that when they were planning, well, they did have a rally a couple of years earlier in which they, they demanded uh, the end of, of ROTC on the campus, reserve officers training on the campus. That never went anywhere, but it was a statement, a symbolic statement about the sentiment on campus against, against the draft. So that when, when the rally was being organized on, on Monday, the original purpose of demonstrating against the Vietnam or the Cambodian incursion had, it had spread <clears throat> to include sentiments about the draft and the reality that the, the government of Ohio, of the state of Ohio was preventing these students from speaking freely their feelings about the war, about Cambodia, about the draft, whatever, whatever was on their mind. And they were offended to have these armed soldiers in their midst uh, from, uh, who were preventing them from, from doing this. On that fateful day, Bob, where were you? You were, you were at the paper some miles from campus and you were in charge. I was in charge. I, I was the managing editor of the Beacon Journal and, and then, and uh, a, a week before uh, the, the <clears throat> all of this took place, my boss, a man named Ben Mainberg, he was the executive editor, uh, went on a, <clears throat> a trip, a junket, we used to call them, uh, to, to Israel with some local business people. So he was gone, and I, I will remember forever what he said to me as he was departing. He said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm gone. Uh, my secretary has my phone number in case you need to get rid of me. He said, but you're in charge. Don't screw it up. <laughs> so, so I had that hanging over my head as we went into, uh, we went into the weekend, and, and, and the uh, tensions began to build. Uh, the Beacon Journal newsroom was 12 miles from the Kent State campus, and it was a local story for us. We covered uh, the education, the sports, the other developments on the campus. But in, in the last several years before 1970, we had a, a very able and tough editor named Pat Engelhardt, who was devoted, intensely devoted, to knowing everything there was about the protesters, the demonstrators, students for a democratic society, and others, so that we covered every little demonstration and reported it fully. So our readership knew what what was going on on the Kent State campus in regards to the anti-war activities. And so we were prepared for anything that might happen. On Monday morning, he, uh, Pat and I met, and we had no inkling that there would be violence that day. We just thought because, in fact, because the demonstration was going to take place in, in, at noon on a, under bright sunshine, that it was very unlikely that there would be would, anything would go wrong. So we assigned um, a young reporter named Jeff Sallett, who had been a stringer for us, on the campus for four years, and he had been he had been covering the many many things about Kent State. He knew he knew the protest uh, culture very well, 
We assigned him to go out to cover the story. We sent two photographers. <clears throat> and as noon approached, um, the, the, the guardsmen began to prepare. They were dressed for combat. They had steel helmets and gas masks and M1 rifles. And for those of you who are not familiar with the weaponry in Korea and World War II, the M1 is a killer weapon. It's for using, killing people in, in combat. So that's what that's the weaponry they had, plus uh, tear gas and tear gas grenade launchers, and they began to move out against the students, and the students uh, were throwing stones at them and yelling, yelling at them, giving them the finger and other things, but not really pressing them very hard. Uh, and they moved, but their their mission was to move the kids out and disperse. The demonstration. So all of this activity went on for quite some time as the guardsmen marched across the campus. At one moment they found themselves trapped against a fence around an athletic field. They were a little confused about that and they sort of had a huddle. Uh, and uh, then I, there's, a, there's a famous picture uh, out of this of a young man, a young student with a black flag. And he's standing all alone in the field with the guardsmen up against the, the athletic fence. Some of them are in a firing position, although they didn't fire. And the others are just sort of milling around. And at that moment, um, it appeared that the, the guard had thought it had accomplished its mission. And they, and they started to reassemble and march back up the hill past the journalism school building on their way to their bivouac area. And the guardsmen, um, this group of guardsmen, uh, as they approached the journalism school building, there was a, a pagoda there with a little funny roof and it had been used as a temporary bus shelter. But they got to that point and all of a sudden, unexpectedly and tragically, they turned and they fired at the students and the students were scattered across the hills and the, at this point in the campus. And, and they, fired, they, they fired 61 bullets, 28 soldiers fired 61 bullets in a volley that lasted 13 seconds. And there were four students killed and nine wounded. Uh, and of course, pandemonium set in and so on. I should tell you a little interesting sidebar about our young reporter, Jeff Sallett, and how, how he was able to enable us to get exclusive coverage in a, in a very interesting way. He, as, as the rally was starting and the students were moving up the hill and the guard was chasing them, he went into the journalism school building and, and he said, I need a telephone. And he, he talked to the, he found the secretary to the dean and, and her name was Margaret Brown. And, and he said, I, can I use your telephone? And she said, well, yes, of course. And so he said, he made his phone call back to Akron to, to the newsroom and told, gave a, a, a running account of what was happening. And then he handed the telephone back to Margaret Brown. He said, would you, would you keep this line open for us? She said, yes, of course. So this, this routine went on for 15 minutes, maybe, uh, as, the, as the action moved around the journalism school, down to the athletic field and back up again. At one point, the National Guard uh, gas, uh, tear gas, began to seep into the air conditioning system in a journalism school and Margaret Brown's eyes were running with tears and, and Jeff Sallett came back and he found her, um, he, he found her under the desk crying and hanging onto that telephone. She was a real hero in, our, in my mind because as it turned out, uh, the telephone system, the big public telephone system run by Ohio Bell collapsed soon after the shooting. And so we had the only open line uh, <clears throat> from the, the campus to to our newsroom, and we were able to get uh, to get the news uh, up, updated routinely because we were an afternoon paper in those days, and we were 
we were right on deadline for a major, the major home delivery press run. So Bob, Bob, when I get to talk to Andrew's class, typically the subject is the First Amendment. And I look at this, and as I told him when I proposed that you join us, this involves clearly assembly, involves freedom of press, involves freedom of speech. And, yeah. and if you could talk a little bit about the sense of responsibility you had, you're reporting this tragic incident. There are conflicting reports about who has been shot right. and what happened. How did you make sure you got it right? Well, uh, it was uh, a matter of, of trusting your people, Jeff Salat, the young reporter, because he was the one who observed the shooting. But what this, let me set the situation for you. Uh, the United Press International, which was a major wire service in those days, a major competitor with the Associated Press, they had a reporter on the campus who was stationed down by the headquarters of the National Guard. And as the, after the sh instantly after the shooting, one of the guardsmen got on the telephone and made a phone call and said, uh, we, have a, we have two dead up here. We need an ambulance. And the, the reporter uh, for the UPI assumed, and that's a terrible thing to assume, he assumed that the two dead were guardsmen. And so he phoned in a flash to UPI headquarters, or to UPI's office in Cleveland, and said, there have been four dead at Kent State, two are students and two are National Guardsmen. And the, the UPI put that out on their, their national wire. And that story ran on page one of the local Kent paper, four dead, two students, and two guardsmen, and on radio stations all across the Middle West, and particularly in Ohio. Uh, meanwhile, the AP is moving a flash that says four students dead. And so we're talking frantically to our young man who's on the telephone in Margaret Brown's office, and he's saying, no, I saw this, it's four students dead. So my editors turned to me and said, what do we do? And I said, well, we're gonna go with our guy. It was a gut, it was a gut decision, I, you know, but I, I really believed in him. And I believe the fact that he was able to observe, observe the action, and therefore with his own eyes had seen four students all dead. So that, that reinforced my, my decision uh, at that moment. And we went with it and we were, we were right. And of course, and uh, the students, uh, the, the UPI had to come back around and and recorrect re correct its error. The Kent paper had to run a whole new edition, replate to run a whole new edition because they had made this mistake. So Bob, I, I grew up in the Chicago area and the Chicago Tribune the next day carried a headline that said, it, to the effect of students riot at Kent State, four killed. And the story coming from the guard was that they were being attacked by students and had no choice but to shoot in response to that. I was struck, I actually had the opportunity to speak at Kent State University two years ago. And I, I stood at the pagoda and looked down to where the bodies would have been because they're all clearly marked at Kent State. Right. It's a huge distance. I mean, I don't think I can throw a baseball as far as that was. I, so the, the idea that students were throwing rocks from there is ludicrous. Um, what is actually the truth of what happened? I understand the students, a number of them were actually shot in the back, so they weren't approaching the troops. Well, two of, two of the students, Bill Schroeder and Sandy Schroeder, were a long distance away. They were walking to class, to their one o'clock class. The two, there were two uh, others who were demonstrators, Allison Krauss and Jeff Miller. Uh, and you, then we have photographs of them and, you know, Jeff Miller is giving the guard the finger and he looks a little bit like a hippie. He's got a bandana on and stuff like that. Uh, but the photo, the photo evidence 
is very persuasive. There are three student photographers who took the dramatic photographs. And, and in, my, in my book, I use their photographs, their images, plus one from a Beacon Journal photographer, to demonstrate that uh, the students were not pressing the guard in the way the guard claimed. And um, this, th these images provided, provided the evidence, evidence for that. Uh, so, um, so there were really two, two what I call misrepresentations by the guard commanders because they wanted desperately to shift the blame from their soldiers to the students, the demonstrators. And that's, what the, that, that, that's where the headline in the Tribune comes into play in my mind because <clears throat> the students, uh, they were throwing some stones and rocks, but the, the evidence is, is very clear that they, they were not threatening the lives of the guardsmen. So the guardsmen, the guard leadership claimed that, that they had to shoot because their lives were in danger. The other thing was that they claimed that there was a, a bullet hole, a sniper, uh, that's shot from the, from the demonstrators, where the demonstrators were, towards the guardsmen. And that's why the guardsmen had to shoot. The, the student, the actual story, and, and so we reported that. We didn't uh, give it any particular attention, but we said that was part of the guards' leadership explanation. We didn't believe that. And so we decided to do our own test. And we, and we found that the, the evidence that the, that the guard was pointing to, of course, was a, a 15 foot tall metal sculpture right by the journalism school building and as it turned out, the pagoda. And it had a bullet hole in it. And to the untrained eye, the bullet hole would suggest that the bullet might have come from where the demonstrators were because the, when a bullet goes in and comes out, it leaves two different fingerprints. The, where it goes in, as, as the guard was claiming, it, the, the metal furs out and then there's a clean circle where the bullet exits. So they were claiming that was evidence. And so we found a piece of, we found the sculptor and we took a piece of metal and we went out to a field and we did some shooting and it proved just the opposite. Um, that uh, the, the, the bullet was indeed shot from the guard's position. <clears throat> now how we handled this story was very interesting. Um, and was typical of our approach to how we cover things like this. We had a young reporter named Kathy Lilly who went, who was assigned to go out and observe uh, the shooting, the testing. Uh, she, she, but when it came to writing the story, and it was the Beacon Journal story, we felt that um, because the newspaper was a participant, there should be no byline in the story. The newspaper should not take any credit for having done this except to report what, what we did. We didn't say the, the bullet came from the guardsmen. We said it came from the position where the guardsmen were. And, and, and we just sort of laid it out without, without any, any suggested commentary at all, even though, as it turned out, that, would, that diffused the whole sniper argument, which was one of the core, core claims claims of the guard for who who caused the shooting. Bob, you uh, you ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize in large part because of what happened in a two week, three week period in particular. Yeah. Um, and what I'm struck by in reading your book is how unsympathetic townspeople were, even if you reported things that led. Uh, the public to understand that there was no riot, there was a significant percentage of that community who just, I mean, the, the quotes are astonishing. I've yeah. seen newscasts, I wish they would have killed more. Uh, yeah. From housewives right. coming out of a grocery store. That had to make your job tougher. Well, it did. And, and, and we, had, uh, we had an enormous flow 
of angry letters to the editor. Uh, and and the, the period where I think the, the hate letters were most intense came six weeks after the shooting uh, when our reporter in, uh, who covered the county of Kent and uh, got a hold of a, uh, the county prosecutor leaked it to him or gave it to him to read uh, the summary of the FBI's investigation. Uh, Nixon was very angry that all this had taken place and, and J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, sent in a big number of investigators from the FBI immediately after the shooting uh, to investigate. They were going to look for this, the anti-war radicals who caused all this trouble. So the, the FBI came in, did their investigation, and prepared a summary of its findings for a grand jury in the local county. And the prosecutor gave this to our reporter, and he said, you can read it but you can't have it. So as it turns out, the telephone rang and the prosecutor's on the telephone and he keeps talking and talking and our reporter keeps reading and reading and he's got it all memorized by the time the telephone call ends and he hands the, the document back to the, to the prosecutor. And of course it was a blockbuster because the FBI's summary was that the guardsmen didn't have to shoot. Their lives were not in danger. There were other ways of, of diffusing the demonstration. And, you know, we, we went bonkers with that story. In those days, when you had a great story, you put a copyright line on it. <laughs> so we put a copyright line on it and everybody copied us around the country. Well, we got some of the worst letters of hatred. How dare you? How dare you uh, take something from the FBI? How dare you criticize uh, the National Guard, et cetera. And it was, it was really overwhelming. Bob, we have a, the things and, sorry, we have a number of future journalists in the, in the class here. You know, you were a young man in really a, a, a level, at a level of responsibility you had not had before. Your boss specifically told you not to screw it up. You had to make a call that would contradict the, U, U, well, the, the wire service, UPI service, and they were respected. And then you had all these people hating you. Where did you summon up the courage to do the right thing? Well, it, it, I, it, was, it had been pounded into me by my editors when I was a young reporter in Akron. The, the owner of our newspaper at our newspaper company was a man named John S. Knight. He was revered as a, an owner for two reasons. One was that uh, he, he was a good businessman, but he, he cared most about the news and about getting the truth. And, and one of his models was get the truth and print it. And he really meant it. And Jack Knight uh, not only uh, set the standard uh, for how we did our work, but he, was, uh, he, he wrote a column on Sundays which went to all the night papers in Miami and, and Detroit and Charlotte and so on, and which he had been criticizing the Vietnam War since the 1950s when the French were still there. Uh, and so he was, he was just a fabulous role model for us. And we knew that he was gonna be tough on us if we screwed up. And so we, the values, the, stand, the, the great, fundamental journalistic values that he so loved and honored and, and we had to we just had to toe the line that's all yeah, that's and so, actually ins inspiring to hear yeah so let me tell you that uh on the fbi story i wrote the lead and in in the in the, in the first paragraph uh i said in my story that the fbi had concluded and it was the wrong word. And uh, Jack, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was looking for something to criticize us for that. He wrote a personal letter to Jack Knight and you know, attacked us and so on. And, and he did point out the error that I had inserted in the story by using the word concluded instead of summarized or some other word. 
And um, so Jack Knight responded to him in a very tough letter, which concluded with the line, there's no need for you to <clears throat> lecture the editor for we're as interested in the truth as you are. But uh, in, 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 in his letter to J. Edgar Hoover, he acknowledged the error. He didn't name me, but he acknowledged the error. And I was really proud of the paper. I was chagrined that I had not been smart enough to find the right word, but nevertheless, it was in the paper and we apologized for it. And we apologized for it in a very public way, which I so, thought was, was a wonderful statement. So Bob, you dutifully covered this and you told the truth. Um, what was the outcome? What happened in the criminal courts and in the civil courts that, that, that came um, lawsuits and, and charges that followed? Well, there were nine years of court cases um, that followed the shootings. <clears throat> Some of them were in the state of, in, in the county of Ravenna. Some of them were in the state of Ohio. Some were federal courts. Some were other courts. Um, there was a federal trial in which eight guardsmen were indicted and acquitted. Uh, we always felt, but we never said so in the paper, but that there were a lot of rural minded people who were just against the guardsmen and, 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 and maybe the trials weren't, or the hearings weren't as, as, as fair as, as, they, as they should be. So, uh, that was, so that was sort of the way all of that went. And the final, the final uh, adjudication was a settlement in 1979 in which <clears throat> $675,000 was distributed among the survivors of the four victims and some others, including a young, a young, uh, a young man named Dean Kaler, who was, whose wounds took away his ability to walk for life. So that was how all that came out. So Bob, this is a somewhat unfair question, but you're the authority. You know, uh, initially, there's some sense that these uh, guardsmen um, shot spontaneously. There's questions about whether they were ordered. How did this happen? What is your personal theory about what ignited the shooting? Well, I, I, I really don't have any evidence. Um, people have been looking for the answer to that question for 50 years. And there's a lot of theories. Um, I try not to have my own theories because the book is something about something else. But uh, I, I, so I really don't know. It seemed to many people that it was simply spontaneous. Now there, there is a, a school of thought that goes back to that moment when the guardsmen were <clears throat> against the fence down by the football field. And there was a group of them that got together. And the suspicion is, not my suspicion, but the suspicion is that this is where they plotted and said, well, we're gonna shoot these kids and blah, blah, blah. And that they, they went up to the hill and turned around and so on. Um, one of the interesting things about, that I should have mentioned when I was talking about the court cases is they, it is the lack of responsibility uh, from the, the guard commander, uh, Brigadier General Robert Canterbury. He was in charge of all the troops at Kent State. And, and in, in one of the, the critical pictures, well, the, the picture on the cover of my book, you can see that, uh, Canterbury in the back. And he's wearing a civilian suit with a necktie and a blue, a blue jacket. And he has a, a, a gas mask popped on his head and he's got his hand up and he's trying to apparently stop the shooting. But he, in all of the um, testimony in which he was involved, he, uh, he refused to accept any, any responsibility for the command failures. There's a whole list of items that you, if you're the commander of the unit, you're, you're responsible for. So in, as I was finishing the book, I raised to myself the question, well, why wasn't he court-martialed? 
And um, with, with the wise help of our son, Rob, who's a Navy lawyer, he said, Dad, he said, if, if General Canterbury had been, and, and the, the National Guard had been assigned by President Nixon, they would have been federal employees and they would have been subject to the, the, command, the uh, universal military justice system where he could have been guard fighter. But because he was appointed by the governor of Ohio, he was a state employee and there was no, no law in Ohio that would cover that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's why, that, that, at least I said it myself, I myself to figure out why General Canterbury never got, never got court martial. We're about to turn to the students uh, for questions. Uh, let me just ask you one more question while they prepare uh, for what they would like to ask. I was struck by the fact that the newspaper, Akron Beacon Journal, that did such heroic reporting, ends up saying, the editorial page ends up saying that it was a good thing that the guardsmen did not face any penalties. They applauded that decision. Is that how you felt at the time? I felt that it was wrong. <clears throat> it was not the, the thing we should be saying. I thought that that <clears throat> more legal action needed to be taken to give the full picture of uh, of the situation. But I respected the fact that in our newsroom, the editorial page was totally independent from the news department, and I, as managing editor, had no voice in. Uh, and to dictating what might be, you know, an editorial or so on. So, uh, you know, I respected that, and that's the way that's the way it was left. So, and and which for the class, this is the way it's worked for decades in the in the news business. The yeah. news people report the facts, and the editorial page uh, crafts an opinion. You asked a question of me about the use of the word riots. In yes, the sir. And, and I have a thought about that. Um, there, is a, there is a clear distinction between riots and protests in, in the, our language. And in many cases, we use the word riots. And it was not simply because it's a, <clears throat> it's a more comfortable word count <laughs> for the headline writer. But the fact is that a riot is where damage is done. Or, or and so on, and in some cases, well, on the Friday night when they were breaking windows in the downtown bars, that that and meets our definition of a riot. When uh, when you're throwing stones at National Guardsmen, that may or may not, but it's it, it has it, it it can be fit into the definition of a riot. So. What we were, uh, let's see, we called um, we called it riots. We called it a, an outburst. Uh, but the, um, the the basically the the argument is that the protesters and we use the word protesters and demonstrators consistently in the book. And these were people who were legitimately expressing their First Amendment rights. Uh, and, and, and by, by using the word protest as often as we did in the newspaper as well as in my book, that is what we were trying to convey. Uh, and so for what people who say these are these rioters and these radicals and so on. They, well, they, this they, came they, up in an earlier conversation with my friend Bob because today we see protests all over the country, Black Lives Matters, and Black Lives Matter, and then we have criticism from politicians who say they're not demonstrators, they're, they're looters. And as far back as Kent State, and uh, probably before that, how the news media describe that, that activity goes a long way to shaping public opinion. And the challenge is, if you're in the news media, how do you define riot, and when does it become a riot? Uh, as I was looking through the Akron Beacon Journal, there, there's some language in there where they talk about charging students when, when already Bob and his team knew that the students weren't charging towards the, uh, the guardsmen. But anyway, the power of words to shape opinion. I know we have several questions. 
I have a two part question. One, were there any charges brought against the paper and were the members of the paper required to testify in the cases against the guardsmen? That's a very good question. There were, there were no charges brought against the newspaper. That was uh, that's sort of unheard of unless um, because we have such a strong First Amendment protections that as long as we're being truthful, uh, we're pretty much immune from, you know, people claim libel and other <clears throat> defamation and so on. Mm -hmm. But none of that was ever even threatened in our case. You know, on our reporters, uh, you know, we have good lawyers in our newsrooms, in our newspapers, and had there been any any uh, suggestion that our lawyers would have stepped in and to protect protect our journalists. Now, one one uh, of our well, young this young Je Jeff Sallet um, was uh, the FBI wanted to interview him, and uh, he was very nervous about it, as, as was I. Mm -hmm. And we struck a, a deal uh, in which we would allow Jeff to be interviewed. <clears throat> as long as the questions were only about things that he reported. Okay. There were things that were in his stories. He was allowed to respond. And what the guardsman or what the FBI was looking for, of course, was something different. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, th that didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. um, you said, <clears throat> excuse me, you said you broke this story in your afternoon edition. Um, what time did you publish it and how much time did you have? Well, our first edition, which went to the outlying counties around Akron, went to press about 11 o'clock. And uh, <clears throat> then uh, we did some major replating for the first afternoon edition, which we called, in those days, we called it the Two Star. And it went to the uh, home delivery uh, locations for the major suburbs in the county surrounding Akron. And that pay, that edition uh, went to press about 1.30. And then the main Akron home edition uh, went to press about three o'clock. And then we had a final edition called the night final. And in, <laughs> It was only street sales only, and it carried all the stock reports for the day. I mean, this is when the stock market closed at, you know, four o'clock, and you could get all the stock listings in. We used to have page after page of stock prices that were fresh. I mean, that was a big seller for, you know, in particularly in the downtown area. So those were the four, four editions that we had every day. And on the day of the Kent State shootings, we were between the first edition, that, that early rural edition called the Seven Star, and the, and the two edition, the suburban -ish edition, and we held the press for about an hour. And of course, I kept getting hammered by the production guy who wanted to press the, the green button on the big press. I said, we just can't do it, we can't do it. We were trying to reorganize uh, <clears throat> The, the circulation truck runs, calling calling trucks back from the rural areas so we could get extra copies of, of the first edition with the shooting in it, which was gonna go to, we finally went to press around 2.30. And then, um, then we held some more for the Akron edition, the one star. And, and by the time we got to um, the night final, we had the story, Pretty well, pretty well wrapped up. The interesting little sidebar about how we got the names of the victims because everybody was rushing out to the hospital in Ravenna, which was near about six miles from the campus. We had a we had a young reporter, uh, another young reporter named Bob Page, who we sent out, and he got to the hospital, and the place was crowded by reporters and demonstrators and others. And there were a couple of guards there not letting anybody in the building, in the hospital building. And there was a kind of a dust up 
in which one, one of the one of the demonstrators spit on uh, one of the guards, and he got all puffed up. And his friend came running and left the door unguarded, so Bob Page slept in there and <laughs> had. The, for a moment, had the whole place to himself and as, a, as a journalist. And he ran into a, a nurse and said, introduced himself. And she said, oh, I'll be, I'll be happy to help you. And, and she took him to, to the room where the doctor was you know, pulling the sheets over the victims. And he later, uh, he later explained to me that he thought that uh, the reason that he got such good treatment from that nurse was that she had dealt with the paper before and, and there was there was trust. She trusted wow. us. And, and that was a, that was a, an opportunity. And then and then the hospital in its wisdom uh, <clears throat> appointed the local congressman to be the spokesperson for the hospital and, and dealing with the press and so on. And he wasn't gonna have a press conference until six thirty. Well that was way past our deadline. So um, meantime, uh, we had sent out another reporter to help with help Bob Page, and the two of them trying to figure out how how to um, uh, how to do this. And so uh, they both knew the, the representative, his congressman, <laughs> and they noticed that he was standing there all by himself, and he had a sheet of paper in his hand holding it down by his side, and it had a lot of names on it. And so one of them engaged the congressman in a conversation about politics, and the other, the other Bob Page, started writing the names, the names of the victims down. So we finally, we had it, and, and, and then we had, we had done another little telephone thing. When Bob Page got to the hospital, he called, he said, he said, I, I was, I, I had a pocket full of dimes. He said, Pat never told me never to go out of the office without a pocket full of dimes. So I put the dimes in and he called him and, and they made their connection. And Pat says, okay, uh, hang up and then let the telephone cord dangle like a yo-yo on the wall <laughs> because it, it was a place in the hospital where not very many people were. So there's this, tele, this telephone dangling on the wall and Pat Bob Page has this, this page with all the names on and he runs over and starts throwing the dimes in and calls the names back. And so by 4.30, we, we had all the names uh, and they ran in our last edition. All these wonderful stories, Bob. And yet somehow it sounds like those of us who worked during that era were riding dinosaurs. This, yeah. this was a time when if a story broke at 6 p.m., you had no way to get the information to your readers for another 14 hours. Sure. If, yeah. if a reporter came across a story, he couldn't pull something out of his phone and call in. <laughs> he had to find a working phone and probably put dimes uh, in that to make the call. And yet, despite that, you won the Pulitzer Prize. So, so well done. Um, <laughs> I believe we have some more questions. We have time for two more questions. You mentioned earlier that while this was going on, the governor was engaged in a race for nomination, right? And you said he went on to lost that. D did, did this whole um, situation affect like his nomination? Do you think that's part of why he lost? And um, also, like aside from that, did he face any sort of repercussions or issues for involving the... National Guard or the the Guard in the first place? Well, the governor, uh, uh, Governor Rhodes, was uh, quite a ways behind a, a Representative Taft. And uh, they had a debate on Saturday night, May the 2nd, in Cleveland. And Rhodes, uh, Rhodes was really on the attack. And then uh, he decided, he and his aides decided that if they were tough on the radicals in this part of northern Ohio where there was not a lot of anti, not a lot of anti-war sentiment, that he might gain some votes. 
And as it turned out, um, it worked for him, apparently, because he only lost the, the primary, which was the, the day following Kent State on May the 5th. He only lost it by 7,000 votes. So his tactic apparently was effective. We have time for one more question. So you talked a lot about how you trusted your reporter, um, which caused some discrepancies in the, in the different stories. Uh, obviously the truth ended up coming out eventually. Did you ever like highlight what the differences were and how you were right and they were not to keep uh, the readers? And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna ask the, the stereotypical question Obviously, you weren't thinking, oh, this is going to win me a Pulitzer Prize, but did you think, you know, that this is, a, this is going to be one of the biggest stories to ever happen, and we're still going to be talking about it all the way into the next millennium? Well, uh, my mind doesn't work that way. Um, I, I, my job at that time was to give direction to the staff to let those people who had the their responsibilities like the state editor, Pat Engelhart, and others do their jobs. Um, I was concerned about the, the mental stability, and stability is not the right word, but the, the emotional impact of this story on my, on my, the young people on the staff particularly because many of them had gone to Kent State and many of them had acquaintanceships at least with uh, people who were involved in the demonstration and who maybe <clears throat> didn't, get, didn't get shot but got shot at. And, and uh, they had to work long hours and under, under what they, I, I now think of as, as considerable pressure uh, in those days, newspapers did not hire, offer um, co co uh, counseling, counseling uh, from <clears throat> people who are specialists in this field or for working reporters uh, or editors uh, so that uh, they just sort of had to bear it on their own. And, uh, you know, today you can, newspaper companies uh, have, <clears throat> counselors and so on that that uh, deal with emotions and, and so on. Post-trauma. Post-trauma, post-traumatic stress and so on. We didn't have any of that, uh, but these people were so dedicated to what they were doing and, and were so committed to telling the truth uh, and <clears throat> um, they were, their stories um, reflected uh, mainly the idea of this is this is a truthful narrative we're creating and it was you know it was it was it wasn't too long after the shootings that we looked back and said you know we have created a truthful narrative that we think is going to last and it did last it's lasted for 50 years and more yeah. and in, in, in which um our version, carefully reported and, and written, is now the standard story, and which is reflected in my book on how we did that. And it's a proud moment for me to think about it. And I think it's a proud moment for the, the Beacon Journal uh, in, in, in its struggle to remain a viable newspaper. One of the uh, unique things about your book, Bob, is there have been a number of books about Kent State, but yours tells a story from inside that newsroom. And that, that's why I recommend it, particularly highly for journalism students. It is, it is the real thing. You talked about truthful narratives and, and thank you everyone for your excellent questions. I don't wanna close though without asking you, Bob, about truthful narratives today. What did you learn in that period? What lessons did you learn that can apply today to this generation of news consumers? Well, I have um, one of the things that came from my book that I've now extracted and have posted on my website uh, is, is what I call um, the, 
the eight lessons <clears throat> that you can take away from Kent State as it was reported in 1970 uh, and consider them as a toolbox for today. And let, let me read the headlines to you. Uh, one, be wary of room. This, these are our are guidelines for news consumers, readers, viewers, listeners, and so on. Number one, be wary of rumors, misinformation, and disinformation. Two, welcome the, the journalistic scrutiny of those who are powerful. Number three, beware of journalists bearing opinions. Number four, give your attention to those journalists who depend on experts who know the subject best. Number five, objectivity is a virtue in a reporter. Number six, beware of false equivalencies. Number seven, don't get sucked into conspiracy theories. And number eight, always be skeptical of what you hear, see, and read right on the money it all applies to today let me just ask I you one, so. <laughs> let me just ask you one quick follow-up for these young people who intend to be reporters who have strong opinions how do you set your opinions aside and be that objective journalist it's all about the story uh it's all about the story and this is why the why journalism is so great the stories are wonderful and if you go out to report them and write them in the frame of mind that says, my job is to get gather the facts and tell the truth, you're going to have a great time, no matter what you, your personal experiences are. Uh, and and that's, my, that's the best message I can give you about why, why it's essential for young people to get into journalism and love it and develop a craft that will inform people in, in so many critical ways today. Well, thank you, Bob, for your time and from your, for your knowledge, your insight. I can tell um, the students here, just echo what Bob has said, when done right, journalism is the most noble profession in the world. And, and people who believe in this as a cause, um, it's not hard to set your personal opinion aside. You, you, have, not a, at all. you have a more important mission. I don't, uh, I don't, you know, my dentist, I, I don't care what his beliefs are, but he can put them aside when he's, his beliefs aside when he's drilling my teeth. And as a journalist, I do the same thing when I'm writing a story. Uh, thank you, Bob. It's a wonderful, wonderful book. I recommend it to all the students and anyone listening. Uh, thank you, Professor Oppen, for making this possible. Emily, thank you for navigating this for us. Thank you, Emily. Uh, and most of all, thank you, Bob, for your many contributions to journalism and for being with us here today. Thank you.